Welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman, coming to you live and direct from Honolulu Airport South Ramp, where a few years ago we were testing some really innovative, uh, we call them medium scale wind turbines. And my favorite one is the one over my um, left shoulder, this one here. Really, I love that turbine. It was so neat. It would automatically weather vane, so it went in the right direction. But what you can't tell about it is when the wind would get up to 35 knots, the turbine would actually flatten out and it would still be spinning like a record player spinning this way instead of this way and still producing electricity. And then when the wind died down, it would roll back to vertical. And it was all done with basic physics and air pressure, no hydraulics, no computers, no nothing. It was really amazing. So we put that one together in about four hours out of the box and it's the only one like it in existence it's about 13 feet in diameter and and anyway it was just an amazing piece of equipment and so we still have it out at hickam and uh, i don't know if the guy that designed it is marketing them but he probably should because they're actually pretty neat and it's really quiet too it's a really quiet wind turbine um, and we tested it down low uh not in the best wind but down low because it was designed to go around an airfield that had approach radar and they and it wasn't allowed to interfere with the approach radar and it did all those things really well that's why we have it in a trailer we were hauling it around to different places on the base but anyway wind turbines are really popular nowadays and you know down in texas um the big wind farms they can produce so much electricity that you can actually buy wind power really cheap in texas like down to two cents a kilowatt hour and on a really bad day, you can sell your wind for like you have to pay people to take your wind. It's it can be that bad. Um, but wind turbines are probably never going to be super popular here in Hawaii because the ones that we do have on the North Shore have gotten a really bad reputation for obnoxious red flashing lights in the middle of the night and um, endangered species getting tangled up at the tips of those blades that are spinning around at 200 miles an hour. You look at them, they don't look like they're going very fast. And at the hub, it looks like it's barely moving. But at the tip of those long, long blades, they're doing 200 miles an hour. And the birds just, if they get in the middle there and they start playing between the turbines and then they slide, slowly slide out. And birds and bats just get schwacked really bad with those things. So I'm not sure they're going to be real popular here in Hawaii. But one thing that we don't talk about much is different ocean power production. And here in Hawaii, we were actually the home of OTEC, which is Ocean Thermal Technology. And I had the inventor of that on my program early on, maybe five years ago, six years ago, uh, Hans Kloss from the University of Hawaii. Um, but it's got to be scaled really, 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 really big. And then we, in the windward side of our island, we have a lot of um, ocean motion uh, where you tether uh, a system to the, to the ocean floor and then you float it up on top. And as the waves move around, they literally pump uh, and, and make electricity by, by moving the arms up and down as the swells go by. And those things seem to work pretty good, but they have a lot of moving parts. And anything going in the ocean with salt water has got to really be robust because the ocean, especially down here in the warm tropics, just eats the daylights out of anything metal, aluminum, steel. And if it's not stainless steel and good stainless steel, good high quality stainless steel. It just takes a major beating, and so do electronic components. But one thing that we haven't really talked about much or looked at are ocean turbines, underwater ocean turbines. And kind of like the ocean thermal, it's got to be fairly large scale to make it economical. Even the big wind turbines, they've got to be fairly large scale to really make it economical to use. Um, but today we're going to talk about some of the ocean um, turbines, underwater ocean turbines, that are in development. And there's several different ones out there. And we got our, our guest today, Dan Goen, uh, again, to talk about ocean uh, turbines. So Dan, welcome to the show. And um, I know you've got some, some good slides here to show. But in this past couple of weeks, I've seen at least three different ocean turbines that are being tested around the world. And, and they all seem to be um, doing pretty good. And so uh, I'll turn it over to you to run through your slides. Sure. But I, I, know, I know from fishing and driving my boat around the islands here, we definitely have the undersea currents, whether it's the ocean moving between the islands or just the tidal changes or, you know, the ocean definitely moves. 
not just at the surface, but down deep. And we could definitely take advantage of some of these things. So why don't you give us an idea of what these uh, monsters do? <laughs> Can do, Stan. So go ahead and uh, show uh, slide number one, please. So I'm just doing a doing there a pitch for the company and just uh, to uh, make sure I do that. So let's go ahead and go to slide number two. And so this is just simply um, um, uh, um, a, a graphic model of something what we're talking about. And these are sea turbines. These are turbines that are underneath the, underneath the water. Now there are two versions of these. There's uh, some that they've been experimenting out in certain areas where they try to take advantage of tidal energy, like in the uh, northern part of Scotland. But there are a lot of us in the engineering community think that there's a better opportunity where these can be used um, in places in deeper parts of the ocean where we can take advantage of deep ocean, deep sea uh, currents. And I know Stan was talking about how reactive a lot of things are, you know, especially in the tropics, because uh, the salt water and metals being reactive and so forth. But there's actually a place where um, things that are made out of metal or steel could be placed at near Hawaii that uh, that water will probably have very little effect on those objects. Uh, and th that's basically if we uh, place these or anchor these things uh, deeper down in the ocean. So if I can get you to go to slide number uh, three, please. Yeah, like for example, you know, one of the things that causes oxidation or corrosion in aluminums and steel is air. Yeah. So, so when you have a lot of this electrical stuff, like I talked about the ocean motions, that's sitting on the surface. Yeah. And even big all the oxygen are... dissolved in the water. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so you get a lot more corrosion. Where after, if you have it underwater, you actually are able to resist a lot of the corrosion because you don't have as much air down there to actually oxidize whatever your metals are. Well, what we're going to talk about besides the oxidation, we're going to talk about another effect too that that adds to helping the you know uh, making sure this equipment lasts a very long time. So, uh, so going back to slide number three there. So what we're showing there that's uh, basically the uh, the world's uh, weather system over the over the Pacific, and those uh, that shows you the basically the general wind and, and weather patterns, and that affects uh, uh, the uh, surface currents, and of course the surface currents affect your deep ocean, your deep sea currents. Um, now, when it comes to around a lot of the islands there in the Pacific, uh, there are a number of islands where these deep sea currents, what they do is they bring up nutrients from the deep depths and bring them up uh, near the biozone around these islands. And that's really what your uh, what all the coral and all the animals and so forth and the fish are eating in these uh, uh, in these coral reefs is that basically these are nutrients that are brought up by these deep sea currents that are bringing nutrients up into that biozone. But the point being is if you locate some of these devices in those areas where those deep sea currents are, we can do, do a lot of great things and not impact the biosphere or, or affect those currents in any way. And the beauty of this is water is really heavy. And when water's in motion, it stays in motion. So let's go to uh, slide number four here. So one of the places that I, I, I was looking at, uh, and that air, red arrow there, I'm pointing at, I got the Big Island. So it's west of the Big Island and south of Maui. There's a place there, and you can see right there, that isn't uh, anywhere near the shore of either one of those islands. And there's sort of a little pocket right there, and that's some pretty deep water. And uh, now the, the reason why we're looking at that, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contrast this with some of the, uh, the ocean wind power uh, turbines that they've been using. And if you've ever got out and seen a documentary like what they install off the coast of like uh, Holland or Germany or someplace like that, those, uh, wind, uh, those ocean wind farms have a couple things in common. One is the water is usually between 21 meters to 35 meters in depth, so it's relatively shallow. The pylons that they drive into the seabed are usually driven in at least 30 meters into the seabed. And the reason why is because when they put in the tower and the nacelle on top of that wind turbine, they'll stand usually about 290 meters tall above the level of the ocean. The other aspect of those uh, ocean wind farms is the equipment they, they use is the same kind of equipment that the oil and gas industry uses to put energy production uh, facilities out in the North Sea. So whenever you're looking at companies that install, uh, especially wind turbines on the ocean, 
you're, you, when you talk to the people or you look at the ships and the equipment they use, understand that a lot of that was bleed over from the oil and gas business because that's kind of what they were doing is they were built basically building platforms out in the middle of the ocean. They're anchoring things in the middle of the ocean and so forth. And I'll, I'll talk about that and that will give you sort of an idea about some of the funding behind um, installing the wind farms in the ocean. And also we'll also talk about why that's probably not a good idea. It's, it, it, I mean, it's not going to be very popular for Hawaii, okay? But it's probably not going to be popular for a lot of parts of the United States for a lot of different reasons. And I'll tell you. Yeah. So, example, waters around Oahu and the Big Island, you can go maybe two miles offshore, and you're in a mile deep water already. You know where you were talking meters up on the North Sea. Yeah. So most of the turbines, if we did put them out at sea in Hawaii would have to actually be even farther out, um, maybe past the three mile limit and maybe even past the 12 mile limit. Out there, the ocean's probably two, two and a half miles deep. Right. Um, so, and- Well, the, the sea turbines will be much more appropriate for Hawaii than doing the ocean wind turbines because what, what, I mean, if you look, if I look at around your islands, those, if you're gonna do sea turbines, they're gonna be pretty close to land. And one of the one of the things that always concern me about those uh, wind turbines, those sea, those ocean wind turbines, is there a navigation hazard? Yeah, that's probably the biggest. You know, because there's always going to be a car container ship, there's always going to be a hurricane or a big storm or a swell, and what do those ships get it slammed up into? You know, that navigation hazard. Not besides airplanes. Not besides it's an eyesore. There are just a lot of issues. And then on top of that. Uh, when you put that kind of equipment in place, it's going to make a, a, a mark on on the land there in Hawaii. If you're going to you're going to put something out there, you want something out there that later on you may want to clean it up, get rid of it, whatever. It's not going to be an eyesore. It's something that's easy to clean up. It's easy to recycle. I mean, those are all the things you need to, need to think about when you put in an energy source. But this is just one of those energy sources that actually solves a lot of problems fairly simply and it's not really that hard to do when you when you finally put all the pieces together how to do this we can go to slide number five please and that there just shows that's the big island south of maui and that i've got the arrow pointed at that that zone right there that gives you an idea how deep the waters we're talking about we're talking 800 to 2800 meters in depth uh obviously this is just all guesstimation on my part You'll probably need like the University of Hawaii to get out there with some undergrad students, some ROVs, and actually start mapping out some of these places and some of the, uh, the ocean floors. Now, yeah. for those, those that are concerned about the biosphere in these kind of places, usually these places that have high amounts of current, usually the ocean floors actually scour clean to bare rock. So there's nothing down there. The life forms actually avoid these places because they otherwise, otherwise the current just sweeps them away. It just so yeah. happens... To, these places where the where your biologicals are not, these are the best great the best places to put these sea turbines. I agree, and and taking it from a local perspective for fishermen, um, the area you're pointing to between the Big Island and Maui, um, I don't know of any fishermen that fish that far out um, and in that area because, like, when you talk about deep sea fishing off the Kona coast, man, they're not even a half mile offshore and they're catching 300, yeah. 600 pound marlin. And bottom fishermen, the most popular place in the state for bottom fishing is um, right near shore or in a place they call Penguin Banks between Molokai and Oahu, where again, the, the water's only maybe 100 meters deep or 500 meters deep at the deepest. It'll actually show up on your depth finder, even if you have a really cheap one uh, and, you're, and you're 10, 15 miles south of, the, of Oahu and probably four or five miles off of uh, Molokai. And that's, you're, so you're not putting in these turbines anywhere near where people would be fishing. Um, they'd be way below any deep sea fishermen and they'd be way below any of the bottom fishermen. Well, it, you're, you're outside of the biosphere because most of your animals and fish and so forth, they live near where the sun is and that's where they're getting their energy from. Uh, when you're talking about these kind of depths at the bottom of the ocean, it is, it is near freezing. There's no light down there. There's just very little life forms in these high current areas. Like I said, the current sweep the bottom free. So just, it's not a biozone. It's not, you're not going to impact anything in that location. There's 
very little life at all living in those locations. I mean, we know very little about the deep ocean. This is that by us exploring these type of power sources, it's a way of exploring these deeps. But what we do know about these locations, there's, there's very little life that could be impacted in those locations. And it's it's definitely outside of out of mind, out of sight. And you're definitely well below the keel of any ship that would go over the top of the ocean or, or it, it and 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 even if you're talking about submarines, we're going to talk about something and I'll show you an aspect of these wind turbines where you wouldn't even have any, it wouldn't be a navigational issue even for submarines, for example, which might be a concern with the United States Navy. But when I show you this, you'll say, oh, this isn't a concern with the Navy. This is something they can easily navigate around. So we can get to slide number seven. Uh, wait, hold on here a second. Now, slide number six, please. And this is the important one. So that area... That arrow again, I'm pointing at the same area. And if you can see the arrows and the arrows with the long tails, that shows you where these really strong currents are at. And if you look real closely where Maui is in the big island, none of those strong currents are even close to those islands, right? They're they're a good 15 miles offshore, you know, where these locations are at. It just so happens that's where these really strong currents are. Now, one of the beauties of this is that these currents are run 24 by 7 by 365. So from a utility aspect, that's base load, right? That is equal to, I've seen some studies, uh, if you, especially if you design your sea turbines correctly, it's equal to a nuclear-fired power plant as far as reliability. It's 24-7 it's power. So you could build base power using something like this is what, I, what I'm getting at. And in fact, for Hawaii, you could probably build an entire industry around this. We can get to slide number seven. First. If you think about it from a from a history standpoint, when we we talked about in a long time ago about putting an undersea cable between the islands to transfer, Harvard, yeah. with, you yeah. know, power from Maui and Molokai to Oahu, for example. Well, if you use these undersea turbines, the cable would be about half as long as that undersea cable. And, and that's a big advantage, too, because less line loss, less of an engineering challenge to get the power where you want it from these turbines under the sea. So, I mean, uh, it's I think it's it, be, it becomes pretty obvious to me. It's at least worth looking at and getting, like you say, the university involved to look at the currents and stuff and do some more analysis. But I think it's really worth looking at. I, I yeah, so if I can get you to show slide number seven here. So and that's uh that's one of the anchors uh, that's off the coast of Scotland and uh, they're lowering it down to the bottom of the ocean. And one of the interesting I'm more interested in has to do with the equipment they're using for doing this. Basically, this is a small size cargo container ship that's got a crane built onto it, and you're just lifting it off the deck and then using ROVs to locate this thing on, on the bottom of the ocean. There's, so there isn't any equipment here that you just can't pick up or remove, okay? But uh, I'm going to go into uh, showing you how this is actually sectioned in multiple pieces. Um, let's see, so we already talked about, yeah, okay, I feel, okay. So we can go to slide number eight, please. Okay, and that's where they're actually putting in place one of the nacelles on top of that anchor. So these are set up so that you first you put in place an anchor and then you can put in possibly a stem and then you put the nacelle on there. Now, initially when you deploy these, you probably will start off with like say a 1.4 megawatt turbine just to get you some good data to figure out is this a good location to put turbines. Right, that's kind of a hint to the University of Hawaii. You might want to invest at least a small one just to pick up some data on good places to place these things. And once you've decided, hey, this is a good place for a sea turbine farm, then you can start putting on those anchors. And the way this is designed is you send the ROVs down with a piece of cable, you pick up that nacelle and you just pick up the entire, hit, just the head and put it on the, on, on the deck of your ship. Then you can pick up the new one and slow her back down with the ROVs and, just, and then hook it right into that anchor and you're up and running. And the way these things are designed, a lot of the quick hookups and so forth are built right into the, the anchor itself. So it's rather, a lot of the, a lot of the design I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna explain to you how simple it is. I mean, that's the key to doing a lot of this is, is using the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, reduce the complexity because you're using ROVs, you're deep under the ocean and the fewer parts, less to break, you know, the less parts to break, the more reliable it's going to be. So if we can go to slide number eight, please. 
Okay. And so that that picture right there is a great picture that gives you an idea. There's a truck in there, so it gives you an idea of scale. And uh, that there is actually just two of the three parts. That's just the anchor with a nacelle on top of the anchor. And the, the third piece that's not shown is you can put a stem on top of this thing. Uh, so if you had to, you could put, put together an undersea turbine that was probably as tall as the Eiffel Tower. And, you know, which is something like 500 meters tall. But the point is it'd be, you know, well, well underneath the water. Now, why you would do that, there are a lot of different reasons. When you go to these areas where these uh, undersea currents are at and you lower down the equipment down there, you can have multiple currents at different strata in the ocean and the water. And it depends on depth where they're at. So that'll dictate how, how tall these things will have to be off the ocean floor. Now, as far as the engineering complexity of this thing, so that nacelle, there are that nacelle is really only made up of is really only made up make, comprised of two parts. Okay, one is the rotator and the other one is the stator. So the rotator, that's the part that rotates. Now on that state on that rotator, there are some blades there. Now on a, a wind turbine. Usually the blades are designed to cant or they, they adjust into the angle of attack, right? And that's because the wind is variable. But these places where these currents are at, the current is stable. So what you do is they set the angle of attack and then they lock the blades in place so they don't move, okay? So that reduces your mechanical complexity right there. The second thing is that uh, on the rotator and that axle, what's inside there is a neodymium magnet. So rare earth permanent magnet in there. Now, what holds that axle in place in that nacelle when they put that insert that axle into that uh, that housing there on the back side of that axle, what they did is they machined out a groove and they put a locking ring on there. And that's the only thing holding that whole thing inside that housing. It's just a lock. Ring. You got to have a special tool to spread that locking ring out to take it off. It, but that's all it's holding in there, holding it in there. So is this is this a basically a, um, a bearingless? Frictionless bearing. It's bearingless. Yeah, it it uses the water for uh, cooling and lubrication. All right. It, it it has what's called an airless bearing, where it's got some propeller blades and actually forces water through there, and it uses the water for the cooling and lubrication. Uh, the stator stationary part, all it has is three copper coils there, or I'm sorry, six copper coils, and the copper is encased in. Uh, hot, uh, high density polythene plastic, right? So that way it's sealed away from the seawater. Now, this device is what we call a variable AC device, alternating current device. Okay, so basically you just have a, a neodymium magnet spinning in, inside of a copper coil. That's the idea. Now, depending on this, on the current, will dictate how fast it's spinning. So it could be the the how, the speed of the spin will dictate what the frequency is, whether it's forty hertz. Or 120 hertz. Okay. Now, in the case of this device, that really isn't that a problem because that alternating current and the fact that usually these things run between 16 to 20 thousand volts, that's what's coming out of them. That kind of voltage, and it's since it's AC, you can transmit voltage directly out of that head directly to shore. 15 miles is really nothing for AC. Now, when you get that power on shore, how do you turn that into useful 60 hertz AC? Is very simple. You take that variable frequency AC, you run it through what's called a bridge rectifier, and that turns it into DC, and then you hook that to an inverter that converts it to 60 hertz AC. So all your electronics are really on shore where you can easily fix and replace and change it and so forth. So there's hardly anything out there on the bottom of the oceans. It's very simple to fix, repair. It's not very complex. Fewer parts. You know, one of the things as an engineer I always have to keep in mind is Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. The more complex the system is, the more chance it has of going wrong. So the key to making these systems work is making them simple, stupid. They're big parts, but they're simple, stupid. Um, there's another aspect of this device. All these components are all made out of steel. Okay, so if you put together a CAD CAM uh, diagram, you know, in electronics, and there are a number of shipyards here in the States, you send them a CAD CAM of, for example, that, that anchor right there, they could build that, right? You can do that, have them do it under contract, or even the housing or the blades or whatever. The other thing about it too, these blades, if you notice how straight those blades are, those blades cavitate. 
And what that means is in the ocean, they make a lot of noise. Now, that's beneficial for a lot of reasons. Number one, this should never become a navigational hazard for a submarine. Because any submarine in the universe should be able to hear this loud turbine spinning in it. The only other life form that might come near one of these things might be a whale. And if you know whales, whales are the same idea. They live by sound. They're going to hear this thing. So any type of a, a submarine or whale or something like that is going to avoid these things because they're noisy. Because those straight blades actually serve a purpose. And that is while they're moving, they're producing lots and lots of noise. So I, I would... I think that the whales would avoid well number one they'd be really down deep and some of the whales can dive pretty deep but yeah. there's nothing oh. down there for them to eat there's nothing yep. down there that they would want and that to currents are so tough they avoid it anyway we already yeah. know that from the data up in scotland that the sea lions and the whales avoid these locations where they have these strong currents mm -hmm. and, the, and the reason why i mean especially when you're talking about whale that's a mammal they have to come up to breathe sure. the chance of them drowning in a place like this is pretty high so they these animals avoid these areas anyway yeah. okay yeah, i had a quick question sure. you, as an engineer do you think it would be possible to put like maybe two anchors a little oversized and span it with a long tube and put maybe five or six turbines oh i agree I, I think that would be a wise idea. I think your limitation on deploying these things is really going to be the deck of the ship because you're going to want to do as much as you can on the deck of a ship and then lower this thing down. So maybe I mean, if, the, if your deck of your ship is wide enough and you got two cranes, yeah, you could probably take two of these and, and hook them to the same sub-assembly and pick them up together and lay them down in the bottom of the ocean. It's, it's probably just going to be the limitation on, on the type of ship now. One of the things when I was looking at this, when I look at the sea, the, 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 the wind turbines that they deploy at sea, a lot of that equipment is very specialized. It's really came out of, like I said, the oil and gas business. For example, they have these jack up ships where they, they bring this ship out and this thing's got like four jacks and it anchors itself in the bottom of the ocean. It actually picks the entire ship up about 20 meters off the surface of the ocean. And the reason why is because they got this 400 ton crane and they have to keep that thing balanced and stable so they can put the several hundred ton this out, you know, sure. because, because this wind turbine is sitting so far up the top of the ocean, it's very dangerous to do this. But this equipment here, you can use a cargo container ship. And these days with the pressures on the cargo container business, which really, um, the economics really favor much larger cargo container ships. So a, a young entrepreneur could probably pick up a small or medium-sized cargo container ship for the cost of scrap metal, right? And all you need is a cargo container ship, a flat deck, and a little crane, and you could use that to deploy these. So th I think this is a much, much easier business to get into just because the requirements are just less stringent, not compared to those wind turbines. Yeah, that and the fact that if we have shipyard guys that want to do work here, we could do some of the construction here. Well, so you've we, got you got a lot of a lot of navy people too, and the, the, yeah. a lot of those navy guys are experts in that ROV technology, underwater te you know technology. So, so you know, and using like the small like Alvin type subs and stuff like that. So you guys have a lot of a lot of a lot, a lot of capability at your hands that other people just don't have. Okay. Okay, we got thirty seconds left. What do you oh. What do you got to, to wrap it up? Well, okay, we can go. The wide ten is a Oahu, and that's just uh, that's just showing more currents around the around Oahu and those islands there. And if we can go to uh, slide number eleven, and that just shows the economic zones where uh, where sea turbines could be deployed. You know, sea, sea turbine farms could be deployed around the islands and around the was I think the Johnson Atoll area. So that gives you, you know, right, right there where some studies have already been done where the optimal places where this could be uh, were deployed around the Hawaiian Islands. But, well, great, Dan. And, and I tell you what, I think that that's given at least some folks that are interested uh, some things to think about because, you know, I, I can tell you talking to Senator Rivieri from our state legislature, he's responsible for the North Shore of Oahu where our wind turbines are. And he hasn't gotten a whole lot of great feedback from his constituents on on land based wind turbines. Um, I think our legislature, when they really start to think about endangered species and all the other impacts, corrosion, subsidies, um, end of life with the wind turbines, you know, and stuff, 
they're probably going to look at the ocean turbines and go, you know what, this might actually be a, a much better option uh, for tourism and everything else. So thanks for the explanation. I really appreciate it. Well, the other thing, too, we talked about those deep waters because of the lack of oxygen and also because of the temperatures, anything you put down that that seems to last a long time. And let me give you a case in point, the Titanic. The reason why the Titanic is in such great shape today is look at the depth of the water that's in. Sure. Low oxygen and the temperatures are so low, there's hardly any chemistry. So if you're going to, as far as deploying equipment, especially for, uh, for a public utility standpoint, this almost a match made in heaven. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to wrap it up here for Stan Energy Man of Think Tech Hawaii. Dan Gowan, thanks for being with us. And uh, he's going to become a regular fixture here, I have a feeling, on Stan Energy Man. So we'll, we'll catch him in another week or two. So until next Tuesday, Stan and Dan, signing off. Aloha. Thank you.